Hello. My name is Richard Hudson, the Editor-in-Chief of Science Business, and I'd like to welcome you to this online conference uh, about the consequences, potential, of the U.S. election for international science cooperation. Can we find new ways to work together for science in all different fields uh, with a new administration, assuming that that is the outcome. Uh, we believe it will be the outcome so far. The, uh, for those of you uh, who are not in the US, I am at the moment uh, speaking to you from Boston. Um, the uh, situation at the moment, as you know, is rather confusing, uh, but the outcome is pretty clear that uh, after all the noise and the fuss, uh, there will be a new president uh, on January 20th. Two dates to keep in mind if you're watching this. December 14th is when the U.S. Electoral College meets, uh, and that's when the official certification of how many votes from each state are pulled together. And then on January 6th, the U.S. Congress will meet, and that's when the results are, are formally finished, done. It's official. Uh, the uh, so just we kind of expect that there's going to be a lot of noise over the next two months, but this event is based on our belief and what seem and our knowledge that there will be a change in government in the U.S. Under those circumstances, uh, how will this affect international science? That's the question that we will be considering. Uh, to, to join us for that discussion, I'm delighted to say we're joined first uh, from Beijing with Wang Huayou, who is the founder and president of the Center for China and Globalization, which is a think tank uh, in Beijing. And he is also a counselor of the China State Council, which is uh, the governing administrative body uh, of, of, the, of the government. Uh, there. Uh, we're also joined for, uh, from Eindhoven in the Netherlands by Robert Jan Smits, who is the president of the Eindhoven University of Technology and is particularly well placed for this discussion because for eight years he was director general for research and innovation at the European Commission. And so he was directly dealing with these issues of international cooperation. Uh, we are also joined uh, from Columbus, Ohio by Carolyn Wagner. She is the Wolf Professor of International Affairs uh, at um, the John Glenn College of Public Affairs in uh, uh, Ohio State University. And we, our fourth panelist is Albert Teich. He's the Research Professor of Science, Technology and International Affairs uh, at George Washington University. And he also has a prior life like Robert Young. He was the, for many years, the Director of Policy at the AAAS, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So a very interesting and knowledgeable crew that we have here to discuss this with you. Uh, there are, uh, I encourage you watching to join in. Uh, there is on the uh, page you see around, ask a question, Slido. Um, you can type in a question there and our staff will relay it to us here. Um, and uh, I should also add that there is a hashtag, as there always is for these things. Uh, it's hashtag uh, US Elections 2020. So uh, now we begin. So to begin with, could I ask each of you just very quickly, just tell me one thing that this election result could mean for international science. Uh, Caroline, let me, let me begin with you. One thing that it could mean. First of all, I wanted to say thank you to Science Business for organizing this really amazing panel of people. I think this is fantastic uh, representation of many different points of view from around the world. Although I think we all have the goal of seeing greater wealth creation and um, knowledge creation emerge from our international system. Um, so I do appreciate the chance to do this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things uh, that may emerge from a new administration is the return to an openness of the United States 
system to international visitors and participants of all kinds. Uh, we know that the US system has been able to uh, be as vibrant as it has by being an open system and welcoming to people with talent from all around the world, as well as linking to people of talent all around the world. So not just that they come here, but they also are partners with us. So I, I hope that we have a return to a robust uh, international connection um, of the US science system. And that had, just a quick question, and that had changed under Trump, had it? So the system somewhat operates on its own dynamics. So to some extent, it does not get necessarily get affected directly, but there are places around the edges where the Trump administration had um, begun to restrict certain kinds of connections. Okay. So um, that, and that had a dampening effect on the willingness of some people to engage in international collaboration. Okay. Um, that part, um, especially I think the US-China relationship um, has been um, somewhat uh, affected by that. I, and I do hope that um, we come to a, a greater, um, let's say equanimity around the relationship, uh, especially between the United States and China. Okay, Henry, I'll, I'll jump to you in Beijing. What is the one thing that you think could change? Well, I think that uh, probably for, for you know, the, the president-elect Biden, you know, for his administration, he probably will pursue a more multilateral approach. That, that definitely, I think, we, uh, I, we, you know, Center for China and uh, Globalizing just at the webinar uh, yesterday, I, I invited uh, Graham Allison and basically, he said that uh, you know Biden will bury the American first. We will bury uh, unilateralism, and uh, so so that actually uh, uh, you know things going to, to see. We also had uh, Tom Friedman. I, I I had him yesterday also. Basically, he sees he sees that there will be more uh, you know uh, 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 the new look of, of the world. And John Thornton was also on my on my panelist uh, talking about. Uh, uh, you know, that uh, there'd be probably be more dialogue. For me, I would say, yeah. Sorry. No, but very briefly, though, the, the, uh, there are, however, others who say that, well, sure. no, there's been a fundamental change. And so um, the, the music may be less uh, dissonant, but the music is still the music. So, I mean, is, how about that? Well, certainly, I, I would say, you know, I mean, if, uh, if uh, in the, uh, in, in the Trump administration, I mean, at one time, there's something where his officials say is that every Chinese student is a spy. I mean, that is way too much uh, of, the, of, the, of the standards. I mean, we probably will say, I mean, we had one million uh, student uh, studying around the world. I mean, uh, half of them probably in the United States and which generate a lot of uh, revenue. And then for the scientific community, those are great uh, talents, labors, and uh, you know, people that students well, can you do. You were one of them. You, you were one of them at one point. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah. they are bridges and the catalyst, and then they are. So, I mean, those things I, I expect probably will be back normally a bit. Right now, people are afraid, you know, the parents are scared to send the kids to the United States. There, So the UK now have a more student now than the United States. And, uh, you know, so so what I'm hoping is that the women back, the, 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 the common sense and the national uh, rationality may prevail, may at least we can talk. I mean, if it's multilateral for President Bi uh, elect Biden, there will be yeah. multilateral ways to talk in many fronts. So, so that, you know, it's difficult not to see people to talk and just, just, just uh, starting trade war. So, so I think yeah. that problem will take a lot of change. Okay, Robert Young, what's the one thing, one thing that you think could change? Well, I mean, I think we all are expecting uh, cooperation, openness, trust, global engagement. And last but not least, respect. I think that's what everyone is uh, longing for and expecting. So I hope uh, that we will see uh, a big change. Um, but it will also, interestingly enough, uh, put on China enormous pressure also to um, really re-enter this global scene, uh, notably if uh, Biden reaches out to the hands globally to multilateral uh, and respect for multilateralism, it will also be, uh, say, putting pressure on China to really uh, uh, accept a lot of the rules of the game with regard to global engagement. And uh, I think that is something which is going to be quite uh, interesting 
as well to see, because we're all looking at the United States and Biden, but I think when, once Biden goes global again, offers cooperation also towards China, although you know the opinions are of course uh, uh, different uh, what we hear from Washington, it is going to be also for China an enormous pressure to uh, engage back with the rest of the world. Uh, and then we talk about IPR, we talk about a lot of the things uh, which are on the table at the moment. So okay. it will not overly lead to changes, I think, in the, in Washington, but it should also, I think, uh, be a wake up call in China for new forms of engagement. Will, Robert Young, will this also change the way Europeans see international cooperation in any way? Well, I mean, uh, Caroline already mentioned it. Let's be clear. Uh, even during the Trump administration, cooperation between the scientists from Europe and the United States continued. Eh? I mean, in the field of infectious diseases, in the field of nano safety, in the field of cybersecurity, the future of the internet, uh, uh, the transatlantic partnership. I mean, that all continued. It was at the administration level, the two administrations, that you know, not always the people were in place, and in certain areas like environmental. Uh, climate research, there was, of course, uh, uh, more difficulties because of lack of funding or less funding from the United States side. But for the rest, you know, cooperation between scientists, between Europe and the United States just continued uh, also during the uh, Trump administration. Let me be uh, clear about that. I think that now, given notably uh, the policy which Biden has with regard to Green Deal and going back into the, uh, the Paris Agreement, there will be enormous opportunities for the US, for Europe, but also for China jointly to realize this global green agenda. And that's what I hope for. Okay, all right. Al, you in Washington, uh, that is where you are at the moment, that is to say, uh, what is the one thing that you in particular think might change? Well, I think the uh, key thing here is the fact that Biden respects expertise and, uh, sur and will surround himself with people who are actually knowledgeable in the subjects they're supposed to be uh, uh, working on. So I think- one His of wife has a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, Trump has done is to basically um, make decisions by the seat of his pants, or the rather large pants, but never mind now. Uh, he, um, uh, he has. He feels his instinct has um, is the most important thing in, in making decisions. Biden understands, I think, that um, what's important is knowing something about the subject and consulting with people who know more than yourself on this, um, whatever subjects you're having to uh, to make decisions on. And I think that's a uh, uh, that's a good sign. I think there's a lot of a lot of very specific things we can get into with. Uh, we have the time for it, but uh, the, the overall uh, matter is respect for science, respect for expertise, and uh, bringing people into the White House and into decision-making spheres who are knowledgeable about the subjects that they're supposed to be. One, one question just came in on, uh, from the audience, uh, and I'll throw it in right now, because it is, is germane. Uh, this question, this person asks, uh, what about, you know, two thirds of the world research money is actually by in private hands, not public. Will a Biden administration mean anything different for corporate research internationally? Any of you have an opinion on that? Well, I think the same, the same openness that uh, we've, uh, we've just uh, mentioned, the willingness to engage with the world is going to uh, be um, as not, maybe not as much, but maybe as much of uh, to uh, corporate um, cooperation as it is to um, as it is to government cooperation. So yes, I think it'll be an important influence on um, corporate uh, cooperation in the private sector. No, like no difference then, Carolyn. Go ahead. Yeah, so corporate research while it does make a tremendous contribution, is oftentimes based on the basic research coming out of that one third funded by government. So the one of the things that I think uh, we need a return to um, or a more emphasis on is actually something Jan, Robert Jan uh, in, instigated in a very big way, which is openness, right? And um, open sharing of information. Um, I do expect under the Biden administration, we'll see much more support for that. 
But the other aspect of it is that um, any corporate research uh, entity is operating based on talent and uh, talent is created in research universities. So to the extent that we can um, see a, perhaps even a greater emphasis on the support and strength of uh, American research universities under a Biden administration, I think we'll all be better off. Okay. And perhaps oh, Rich, uh, to also follow that, I mean, I think any company, any uh, an enterprise, wherever located, they also want to see a government which has certain guidance. And I think once Biden really puts a great emphasis on the climate and the Green Deal and the energy transition, this will, I think, also motivate and drive the big uh, uh, corporate companies, the big industries to really also step up the investment in this area because they know there will be markets for that. I think that is something which I think will um, mobilize, notably the United States, uh, the private sector. If they see this very clear policy towards the green side, they will certainly jump into that because that is business. Okay, all right. Um, so uh, I, go, go ahead, Ernie. Yeah, I could add uh, that I think that the corporate will play a huge role. Uh, like uh, like uh, in China, you know, multinationals have set up over 3,000 R&D centers or academy or research institute in China. Like uh, Bill Gates said, the uh, best uh, Microsoft is, uh, uh, you know, R&D uh, academies in China. I mean, uh, Microsoft uh, employs uh, several thousand people uh, just in Beijing alone, I mean, uh, for R&D research. And then Dell, uh, the American computer company, uh, also have a 5,000 R&D staff in China. So as you can see, there was a, a corporate funded research and development is so important. While we're having this uh, uh, distrust or mistrust um, uh, among the countries, we're going to actually impact. I mean, student uh, talent flow will be stopped, and then multinational will be dried up of all those uh, continuous innovation and invention. Of course, uh, uh, there is there is a large number. You know, over eighty percent of a science technology PhD from China remain in the U.S., contributing significant love of China, uh, U.S. science and technology development. So this kind of a uh, uh, tech war, decouple or, or trade war is really serving nobody's interest. And actually, in the end, we hurt the U.S. as well. Okay, all right. So, uh, Karen, let me come, let me come to you. Let's get a little background information about the uh, uh, just what is the state of international cooperation in science at the moment. So, international cooperation in science is almost all driven by the scientists themselves. Although there are, of course, big, giant mega science projects like the International Space Station or. Uh, CERN that have formal government to government agreements, but the vast majority of research at the international level is instigated by researchers themselves. Um, they usually seek to connect with someone uh, who is um, a fellow expert with complementary capabilities. And my own research shows that 90%, 90% of these international collaborations begin face to face or side by side in some way. People meet by studying together, researching together, meeting at a research location, meeting at a conference, um, and they begin and find an interest, a shared interest in working together. And we have the famous example now of Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier, who knew about each other's work uh, about in CRISPR um, prior to meeting, but it was at a conference where the two of them met and took a walk that they began the CRISPR-Cas9 research that won the Nobel Prize. So, so Caroline, as I think about this, the impact of COVID is pro on science is probably greater than any individual government. Is that right? Well, Henry actually is very much on top of this, and I, I hope he'll address this because he uh, has started a, a program on mobile, mobility and uh, connectivity. Of course, what we're under now is great restriction on travel. Um, so the return to openness and travel is extremely important for science, especially for junior researchers, uh, because the more elite the scientists, the more likely it is they're working at the international level already, because it's a very much reputation economy and attention economy. And so people who are well known get chosen to work with others at the international level. And so we see that even in, for the United States and for other advanced science countries, that all of the growth of their scientific enterprises are driven by international collaborations. Uh, in other words, when you look at the citations to articles, the uh, money, where the money's going, it's going towards this international enterprise. Um, and international collaboration in science act now accounts for probably a third of all scientific um, 
uh, articles. So when you look at just the article, third. yes, a so it's That's a very all. great part of our enterprise, but no single ministry or agency controls it. It's, uh, you know, it emerges from the interests of members uh, to work together uh, and um, kind of comes together out of that. So one of the things we did see, I looked at COVID research in the very earliest days um, of research. And this will be interesting, I think, also to Henry, as we looked at US-China collaboration. And what we found is in the very earliest days of the novel coronavirus, before we even knew it was COVID, uh, we saw that US and China teams um, uh, immediately reestablished connections and began to work together. And the very earliest work that came out, the very, very earliest work came out of China and was very important work. Then US and China um, groups connected and reconnected and began to turn out very important work together. Um, this was a bit uh, underreported because we heard from the US political side that China wasn't cooperating. In fact, at the scientific level, the, the scientists were very actively collaborating and contributing a great deal of important work. Hmm, that's kind of like in the, in the, in the Cold War. Exactly. Uh, there was still co some scientific cooperation going on with Russia. Yeah, well, I certainly can and con uh, you know, uh, agree with uh, Caroline what just said. Actually, at the beginning of, uh, of uh, the, uh, you know, this virus breakout, I mean, China actually, the scientists actually did, did a lot of research. There was hundreds of cases of a Wuhan hospital patient. They have been they have been really uh, building the data and are quickly published in January. Uh, so that's amazing. Already have a lot of uh, hundreds of cases been uh, been tabulated and also been analyzed and then been alerted to the world. So so I think uh, you're right. If we had uh, if not this spoiled by this political uh, and a fight between the two countries, we probably the scientific would probably uh, united and then probably produce more uh, uh, better results or better uh, cooperation outcome. Yeah. But it shows yeah. the power rich of the science community. And is despite all kinds of political tension, always in power, they find each other, they work together. And I mentioned already that uh, during the Trump administration, where there was tension also with regard to Europe, because you know how critical Trump has been on the European Union, accusing the European Union to have been set up in order to do damage to the United States, uh, flirting and supporting openly Brexit with people like Farage. So, I mean, despite all that rhetoric, you know, scientists have been working together uh, during the last uh, number of years. And also the United States did not pull out of CERN, they did not pull out of ITER, uh, the thermonuclear fusion project, they did not pull out of GEO, Earth Observation, International Space Station. So from that point of view, thank God, the science community always reach out to each other. And I think that's the power of science. And we should always uh, see that happening. Okay, Al? The, uh, how do you see the landscape right now? Well, I think what you're talking about is that the scientists and their individual cooperation, which Caroline articulated very well, um, see themselves in a somewhat hostile, larger political environment. And I think that's going to, that's going to change. They're going to see a, a much friendlier, a much friendlier overall environment. You won't see the kind of uh, uh, unpredictable changes like the uh, um, travel ban uh, that was instituted very shortly after Trump took power, the uh, limits on visas, the uh, limits on, uh, the, uh, on foreign students in the, in the U.S. Um, you know, you've got uh, you've got a whole different attitude towards this, uh, towards the internet, to the rest of the world, uh, and uh, the America first. The, the um, uh, I think the lessening of this America first attitude is going to make a major difference in how people see us and how people see how the uh, uh, international cooperation works. Al, Al, you've you've written you've written quite a bit about the history of U.S. policy and science uh, and, and all, but the U.S. was one of the principal reasons after the war why there was a, a growth of institutions and activity on international science. Is that right? Yeah, the U.S. actually had a major role in the uh, creation of CERN. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And um, the first um, first director general, if I recall correctly, first director general of um, CERN was a, um, uh, I guess he was originally a, Euro a European, but he was an American citizen who came over to, uh, to head uh, the uh, institution. And so, yes, I think the U.S., 
has had a, a large role in, in uh, fostering international cooperation outside uh, of other countries as well as the U.S. And I think okay. we're hoping to see a return to that. Okay. All right. Well, um, it, let's let's go to. Uh, I, there are more questions coming in, and we will come to those. Uh, some of them. Uh, let, let's look at the geopolitical issue uh, at the moment. Um, U.S.-China relations in science. Uh, Henry, I'm going to start with you. But how would you characterize it now, and what do you think can be done to change it? Yeah, uh, th uh, thanks, Richard. So I think that uh, you are holding this uh, uh, webinar at uh, you know the fascinating time. I mean, also the crossroads of the of, of the of the uh, you know the world uh, uh, globalization pandemic and uh, and the U.S. election is all this critical uh, uh, two months now. What I think actually the uh, what have been uh, you know downgraded the uh, uh, spiral, which we have a free fall of the China-U.S. relation in the last uh, several years. It's really out of a uh, you know, uh, expectation or imagination of at least for the Chinese, because you know, U.S. has been viewed as very friendly and very uh, uh, as a great uh, uh, promoter of China's openness, and 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 the China actually opened up in 1979 by Deng Xiaoping was exactly the year U.S.-China established diplomatic ties. Uh, just imagine how many Chinese students went to the United States and how many. Uh, trade has been conducted. Con you know, ch so China was able to lift 800 million people out of poverty. I mean, largely, I mean, that is the, due to the pros prosperity of the global trade. So, so I think, you know, somehow, uh, certainly uh, China suddenly become enemy number one is really out of a, a quite a shock to, to many people because we have a still maintain a large people to people bond. Like there's a, the, before the pandemic, there's 3 million Chinese travel to the United States, 2 million American travel to China. Every day there's about three, you know, 300,000 people across Pacific. Uh, you know, there's about 400,000 students in the United States on the campus register. You're not talking about those in high school and not talking about those visiting scholars. So there's probably a half a million there and they're contributing a lot. Uh, so what I see, like the US and China being the two largest uh, uh, scientific uh, knowledge producer now, China probably and uh, patents uh, application probably ranked the number one, number two in the world. And, and also R&D, uh, the, the papers publisher uh, it's also uh, it, it take a big leaps and bounds in the last number of years. So, so I see the two countries actually has so many things in common. I think it's just, you know, if, if, if you, China has a little uh, a different system, but th th this system seems working in China. You know, for example, this pandemic fighting is a good example. I mean, China seems to manage it. You know, I just had a, this a 300 people conference uh, in Beijing today uh, with uh, 30, 40 ambassadors attending. It's all like normal. So China basically almost acting like normal now. But well, but, but Henry, Henry, if, if, but what about the, some of the uh, the allegations from the Trump administration? I mean, for instance, Trump said something to quote, uh, you know, almost every Chinese student who comes to the U.S. is a spy. Uh, he quote uh, he uh, uh, you know the, there's been actions by. Um, the uh, FBI and uh, other U.S. authorities, uh, uh, you know, it, criminal charges actually in some cases brought against Chinese scientists who have been working in the U.S. And then you have the entire, you, you, the, the entire apparatus of the NIH and the NSF becoming far more cautious, I would say, about this and issuing <laughs> universities. Yeah, no, I, I think that is not really true, not really reflect the real situation. I, I, I don't say there's, there, there's none. I mean, there could be a few, but not applied to, to hundreds of thousands of uh, students in the United States. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, China has sent out so many students, I mean, uh, coming to the United States, like, like half a million probably uh, on off uh, basis. And then China only attracted the, you know, master student most of goes back, but PhD in the science technology, 80% remain in the US for the last number of years. So basically helping US. Uh, so what I, what I don't see is that uh, uh, US has this outstanding immigration program every year attracting 40,000 people around the world to the United States. Well, China is only attracting his own, own student, uh, probably some uh, green card from US, but it's still largely 19, 95% uh, ethnic Chinese. So what's what's the problem? They attract uh, some of the returnees back. I, I don't see how big issue is that. Well, As a matter of fact, 
Well, I'd like to address this. Uh, yeah, actually, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of thoughts here. Uh, in the US government, there's a, what is called the mosaic theory. And that is the idea that each person who comes from China takes back a little piece of a larger picture uh, and reassembles it in China. That would require a great deal of thought on the Chinese side. Um, however, the Chinese have bu bumped off the UK as our top partner uh, in science. So um, in fact, for many decades, uh, the UK was uh, the US's top partner. Uh, and now it's China. Um, and so that obviously represents an opportunity. And as Henry says, and I think optimistically, the two powers could come together for incredible human good, um, especially around green energy and um, and the welfare of the food and water systems. If we were to combine our powers, we would do a tremendous thing for the world. However, that is not to say, I personally don't agree with the mosaic theory, but I will point out something else that the Trump administration or any administration should think about. And that is that um, in the past, scientific leadership is very closely tied with military hegemony. If you look at the history of um, modern science. And if you looked at where the center, the world center of science moves, it often moves and it's correlated, closely correlated with military power. Um, we saw Japan, for example, take a run at US leadership in the 70s and 80s, but they didn't make it because they didn't have the links to the military system that is such a catalyst to science and technology development. China does have that connection. And so there is a reason for concern if we look at the big geopolitical system, the big international um, flows over time. So I do think there is cause for concern. The challenge, right, the challenge is not to allow the military um, connections to become so incredibly strong that the two powers become adversaries, but to look for ways to make this work so that we can, in fact, use the norms of science, um, of reciprocity, open-mindedness, and sharing, um, and the connection of that scientific activity for human good that I would view um, as the opportunity of a millennium, um, right, to make a huge impact on, um, on global science. That's why I, from my side, um, in, the, in the opening things, I mentioned very well, very much that if Biden opens up to the rest of the world, it's going to be also for the rest of the world, you know, really uh, a challenge to find the appropriate answer. And then I looked at China, and uh, uh, I really hope, as Caroline said, was Henry, that, you know, the continents, Europe, the United States and China can combine the best brains to address the enormous challenges we have. But it will be for China also, I think, an effort really to uh, come to terms with respect for property rights. And uh, also, um, um, you know, if you look at uh, cybersecurity, the firewalls of all our universities, you know, they are attacked by Chinese and by Russians. I mean, let's be quite clear. So there needs to be something done about that. So the ball will be also very much in the camp of China to do everything to show to Europe, to show to the United States that when Biden will reach out, when Europe will reach out to global engagement and multilateralism, that the basic rules of the game are respected. And I think that is something which everyone is now expecting. So it's a huge opportunity also for China, but there will be, I think, the ball in the camp of China now, certainly when Biden opens up and reaches out to everyone across the world. Henry, are there any specific <laughs> measures, Henry, are there any specific measures that uh, the Chinese government could do to reset the discussion? With the US. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, Richard, you, you raised a great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, China has been really for the last several years. I think there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there, there, there was probably some history of, uh, of uh, you know, IPR issues. I mean, when, 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 when US was taking over UK, there's some IPR issues. When Germany was taking, you know, Japan is taking over, everybody has gone through that kind of period. But now China is the largest patent producer in the world now. I mean, Chinese companies going global also. They have to uh, protect their IPR. And uh, so the, the, the Trump administration has been, keep saying that, you know, China is stealing and everything, but there's not really many hard evidence of that. I mean, you know, I, I wish they, they could every time when they say that they can back up with data and, and numbers and cases so that it's not become a, a, a time that they repeat a thousand times has become a fact. No, I mean, uh, China actually passed the foreign investment law last year and then in that, foreign investment law was swiftly passed in just two or three months. 
they stipulate they stipulate that no no violation of IPR and no false technology transfer whatsoever. If anybody did that, would be severely punished. Actually, Chinese Premier has uh, and the ministers conduct a meeting with multinationals. So please report to me who have violated your still your you know. Well, well Henry, are there? But again, are there any specific measures? that the Chinese government could do to reset. So for instance, the Thousand Talents program has been very controversial in the US. Uh, uh, you know, stop that or change it or, or some specific proposal on IP uh, management or something that indicates. Um, I think they have to start with transparency. I mean, one yeah. of the problems here is the fact that a lot of this about the, uh, the Thousand Talents program um, yeah. you know, has been paying Amer um, uh, Chinese scientists in the U.S. And uh, that wasn't known. I mean, that came out in a way that, that made, uh, I think, um, a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, concerned that this stuff was going on behind the backs of the, uh, of the American government. And so transparency yeah. on both sides, really, uh, I think is a key factor and we need to change, we need to change the, uh, the operating style of you know, both governments in respect to those, uh, some, uh, in respect to talent, for example, you know, in respect to uh, exchange of information about uh, uh, research. Yeah, uh, thanks Al. I, I, I just, just, just re briefly respond to Richard's question. I think the a thousand town program. Yes, there's a way to there's you know there's a room ways to improve. Of course, that absolutely, and uh, maybe conduct more in a tradition like immigration policy. For example, the U.S. has immigration policy. You, every year, is about a million Im immigrants come to the United States. One hundred forty thousand uh, uh, highly skilled immigrants, and there's forty thousand of uh, outstanding immigrants. China just set up a Im national immigration uh, administration. Uh, just about two years ago, uh, under my recommendation. So we could do it a bit more uh, according to the international practice. I, as I agree, more transparent too. But I don't think there's anything big wrong with Southern Panel. Every country has the right to, to attract talents. Indian, Ireland, Canada, you know, Israel, everybody does that. But why China attract its talent, get so much attack? You know, 8,000 talent program, that's about 8,000. 4,000 of them are, uh, are post-doctors. They're already working in China. Well, fine, no problem with that. Maybe there's another few hundred thousand uh, a bit senior. They, there's, the only problem the one that those are uh, traveling back and forth you know, on both sides. Maybe there's double dipping and things like that. There's a few cases like that. But China doesn't favor that. China also is saying that's not correct. So I think what needs China is probably more articulate, more, more, uh, more forthcoming, more uh, explanations, and more transparent. I agree with that. So, but I don't think that uh, totally thousand talent program is wrong. I mean, and, you know, US is tracking so many Chinese talent. Why China cannot track some Chinese own talent back? So it's ridiculous they cannot do that. Or if they do that, it's stealing the knowledge of the US. No. So, so I, I think that we need a really an, a, a right narrative. But, but I, I do agree that we need more transparent. We need more explanations. We need more uh, uh, international practice. Like, so that's why I recommend China to set up a national immigration administration which handles, you know, maybe in the future could handle uh, according to like, like a, you should a green car and then maybe a, a, take a application process openly and uh, attract talent from other world as Henry, well. I'll just, I, as a journalist, yeah. I'll just push this question one, one little inch for that simply to say, are, because of where you are in, 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 the, in the state mm -hmm. council, is there yeah. any consideration being given specifically to some measures to uh, some overtures towards the new Biden administration in the field of science and technology? No, I think there's, there's a lot. I mean, we, we talk about this uh, climate change. I mean, uh, I was at the Munich Security Conference uh, early this year. I, I invited John Kerry to my panel, uh, to my round table. And he told me that he came to Beijing to see uh, President, President Xi and, uh, and persuade the China John Paris Accord. And Biden said, no, the first, uh, the first mandate, the first, uh, first uh, agreement on science is going to come back to climate change of Paris uh, deal. So, so uh, China is doing a lot of things on that. China was reluctant to do that in the past, uh, become, uh, you know, accept the U.S. proposal. Now becoming President Xi at the U.N. summit announced China going to be uh, carbon neutral by 2060, set up a target for a huge country like 1.4 billion people. Uh, so that's enormous. I, I think, you know, that's a great gesture to the President uh, Biden. 
because now Biden comes up to to the to the uh, White House now. He first thing he wants to do is really internationally to have this climate change. I think that the, the pandemic is already a punishment of, of for the mankind, not respect environment, not respect clim climate. We are, get, we are getting to this kind of cycle, like uh, Thomas Friedman said yesterday, that uh, probably those viruses will come back if we don't respect the environment. So I think China is already, you know, if they did a great thing. China put up now the 14th five years plan and also uh, environment protection, you know, the, uh, the, the climate change and uh, all those things are, are on top of agenda. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and also technology is, is very open now for Tesla is just has a huge success in China. While okay. all the factories yeah. shut down, Tesla is selling around the world. So, so let's not China. forget, but Rich, let's yeah. not forget that. I mean, um, despite what Biden's agenda might be, I mean, the Republicans got a hell of a lot of votes and they will certainly have a majority in, in the Senate. So I think um, any engagement with Biden will do at global level, notably towards China, everyone will look at him, certainly the Republicans, to see if China is indeed also reaching out to hands, opening up markets, uh, 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 you know, doing something about property rights, making sure that also the national science programs in China opened up to foreigners so that there's much more transparency, as uh, Henry was saying. I think uh, so there is an enormous, I think, also pressure on China to really, you know, show that this new engagement, which we all are desperately longing for, also from Europe with regard to the United States, that we all are doing everything we can to make it a success because the challenges we are facing are enormous. And let's pull together Let's really work together to address those challenges. So, Robert Yan, then, then, then you think that there should be some kind of overtures made from China? Is that right? Do I Absolutely, that? I'm crystal clear. I mean, we see. Listen, let's be clear about what I mentioned: that the cybersecurity, the, the the attacks on the firewalls of all the universities, and all, they come from Russia and China. I mean, do something about it. Huh? Do something about the property rights. Uh, I mean, that is something. What I said. This is now what we need to do all together, new rules of the game. I think we should not turn back the clock five years ago. Uh, we can't do and we won't. We should look forward and really, you know, and I would call for a summit between the top science leaders and perhaps even at the level of, of the Biden's of this world in which we really are saying, you know, let's reestablish the rules of the game of global engagement. And perhaps not through the traditional mechanisms we had, but perhaps through some new mechanisms. So I, would, I would support that 100%. I think um, Jan Smith's uh, suggestion on uh, you know, a restatement and perhaps a bolstering of the norms of engagement in global science is, is really needed, not just because of the effects of the Trump administration, but the rise of China offers an opportunity as well as a challenge. It is a challenge and I think the sense of uh, a lot of policymakers is to react at the challenge level rather than at the opportunity level. But China has a responsibility too. They are a new player in this global system uh, and they need to begin to act more stately and more international in their approach to the science system. They're benefiting from it tremendously. They need to perhaps increase and greatly increase their contributions to it at the international level. In the US, well, I think a lot of our, a lot of people have reacted to the damages of globalization, which is part of the reason the, the attraction of a Trump, right? So what are we going to say then? And I think with China, it's the same. How do we ensure the benefits of globalization uh, and make sure that they are widely distributed? That has to be more uh, of, a, um, of a deliberate action at the policy level, rather than, ju than just hoping that things spin off or spill right. over from the Rob, science. But if I, Robert, yeah, if I can come to the issue of Europe-US relations also, which is also tied in with this geopolitical discussion. Um, what, are the, what, what could the EU do to try to improve science relations? Well, the, the EU, I think, in, in the EU, there's a lot of discussion now on technological sovereignty as well, becoming more independent. I mean, we were forced as Europe to go into that direction because of the American first and also what we saw happening in China. I think Europe will be the first continent to say, let's indeed go to some new rules of the game. Let's recommit to global cooperation on the enormous challenges we're facing. So I think Europe can play a very important role as bridge between you know, uh, China and the United States taking indeed uh, a leadership. Because don't forget, 
Um, I know we talk a lot about China and the United States. With 7% of the world population, Europe is still providing one third of the world's knowledge. Yeah? So, I mean, it's a continent which still is uh, uh, playing its important role and contributing. So that's why I call for not setting like the clock five years ago, but really having a summit at the highest level in which we say, let's discuss the new rules of the Uh, I believe, Robert Jan, you've frozen for, for a moment there. Uh, but we, we will come back to the European issue as soon as you come back to us. Henry, just a, a, a last word on this geopolitical thing. Did you want to add anything else on what's been said? There? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I, I think that the, the discussion is really a great, a great discussion. What I, what I think is that uh, the, the thing that uh, Biden administration can do is that uh, at least you know, there's some uh, you know, rationality may come back because... You know, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, talk about China this and China that. that we, remember, that started actually with the U.S. Uh, 2017 when uh, President Biden just come up. Uh, the, the, the National Security you know, the Office issued a, a report positioning China as a strategic rivalry for the first time ahead of mm -hmm. Russia. So, so that actually, you know, triggering a, a, a host of a, a negative uh, narrative on China from Congress, from everybody. So now is uh, these days if it's it's, it's politically correct it, it, incorrect if they're not bashing china so okay. so that kind of narrative has already prevailed so what okay. i think actually china's done not i also want to uh, respond to what karen just said china is now is is now the second largest un donors now uh, the the the, the uh, on this covid 19 china pledged 2 billion helping uh, developing country president xi actually said that uh, so china is is uh, is doing many things so so i hope you know, because the, the Western media is not covering China as much as, as they cover US and Europe, a lot of good stuff can't come out. You know, China has been lifting poverty by the end of this year now. So well, I propose, we have, I agree with uh, Robert that we should have a summit. You know, let's have, a, let's have a climate summit. Let's have a vaccine summit. So let's have a G7 plus China plus Russia plus India with all the signing because the, a vaccine summit because ninety percent of manufacture of vaccine are based in these ten countries, and then climate change. You know those are uh, six are largest uh, polluters uh, among the G uh, ten countries. So let's have a G ten summit. Uh, Two hundred eight financial crisis created a G twenty summit. This pandemic so, could, could create a G ten summit that really going to help solve so specific, more specifically specifically on vaccines, Henry. Yeah, yeah. We could do vaccine and climate change. I mean, could the, the two. climate change? Yeah, the two. I well, think. you probably will yeah. need, I think we, you we, probably we, need, we, yeah, sure, sure to have, a, I think a topic is fine, but we talk about rules of engagement. I think that is, that is, that is the, that's what it's something I talk about, you know, it will, of course, you need a kind of a pilot, a new, say, a thing to bring people together and the vaccine or whatever could be a nice thing or the environmental, but the rules of engagement, I would also care, I was saying, that's what we should really talk about at the most senior level, you know, how are we, again, redefining our rules of engagement with transparency, and we say, with respect for IPR, with indeed reaching out to each other, having mobility of our scientists, uh, working together, uh, a system based on trust again, instead of mistrust. That's what I think is first and foremost should be on the agenda of such a summit. Well, I think that for the change of administration is a perfect opportunity to do that. Yes. This is, uh, this, this is a moment that we need to take advantage of. Yeah. So there, so there should be some kind of, a science summit? Is that what you're saying? A, 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 um, a specifically focused on the rules of engagement, you say, as opposed to the topics, whereas Henry is saying climate change and, and uh, pandemic response, vaccines. Well, no, it's, I, I think it's it's really sure. rules of engagement. It's norms of engagement, right? Exactly. Because you don't want to impose rules on the system. No, no, no. It's and norms. With, Right, sure. it's norms, and this is where I think Europe has taken the lead, and Jan Smith, Robert, Jan is uh, uh, one of the world leaders on this, and that is an openness, open platforms. We need open platforms for open data. We need open publications. We need open citations. Um, these are really critical things, and we also need funds, pots of money to which anyone of excellence in the world can apply, regardless of nation and regardless of political affiliation. Let's let people organize based on talent and, and ambition rather than because they're a national 
member and therefore able to access per, you know, specific funds. And I think what we need at the summit is a commitment to some exercises, some, some pilot projects that set up these international pots of money um, towards these kinds of um, global goals. Carolyn, there's, oh, there's a question that came in that's from one of the viewers that's related to this. It is, do, you, do you see it as the right time to establish a kind of international network of research activities supporting global green transformation? So, I mean, that's basically climate research and innovation. Should there be, will we ever get to the point where there's a, a I don't know, a UN fund or a CERN for uh, for uh, global green, uh, global climate research. Should we have that? So if you look at the way international cooperation works already, we already have that network. And almost all the time, individuals within a network are going to go towards resources, right? They're gonna to go towards where the money is. So unfortunately that's how it works. So the more we put money and pots of money out there and based on merit and um, talent and capability, allow people to self-organize into teams, that's when you get the vibrancy of science. That is what makes science, international science really so rich for our world. So yes, we need more pots of money and pots of money that aren't tied to national prestige, that aren't tied to specific outcomes. We don't wanna determine outcomes ahead of time. You have to let research be curious, curiosity driven. But these are the functions that we know work well for um, in invigorating a science system. I think we know those rules. Let's make those the norms of global science. Absolutely, and I think Richard would be great if such a summit should it should be between the heads of state. You know, it should be about uh, Biden at that level. But of course, letting them launch a major initiative, uh, like Ellen was saying, where we put a pot of money, you know, for the best brains from all over the world to tackle some of the global issues. And you can start with climate, you can start with infectious diseases. I don't care, but I mean, really show that the senior leaders of the world are turning the page want to reach out to each other in openness and cooperation as a symbol they put uh, money uh, make money available for the best brains from all our continents to work together as partners i think robert, it was, yeah, that would but, be great but robert, robert yeah, there, is a, there is a political so, uh, there is a political problem in every country and including in the eu of politicians not wanting to spend tax money on non on foreigners as it were uh, you have this with horizon right now with uh, you know the current Horizon Europe deal uh, appears likely to limit uh, non uh, EU participation in like the European Innovation Council. So how do you should that is that political instinct change? If you want, if you're committed, Rich, to turning the page and go from an openness, you should the rules should follow the policy and not the other way around. In other That's words, fine. if this is the commitment we have, we need to be, you know, make it sure that the rules are such that we can do these things. It's oh. only rare instances in which I think institutions have been able to overcome that uh, idea of fair return. To, you know, of, of uh, we want we're we're putting in fifty percent or thirty percent of the funds for this uh, organization. We want thirty percent back. You know, so somehow that has to, that's a political attitude. It has to do with sovereignty it has, and it has to do with, with um, basic uh, differential um, uh, resources in different countries. So I think that's it's, it's a very tough uh, nut to crack. Yeah, but I mean, the technicality should not, I should I say, hamper the main objective, I think, on which we all agree. Well, and this gets back to Richard, one of Richard's original questions, right? Um, and that, you know, and Al's right, people uh, who put in the money want to know, are they getting the return? But if you look over time, uh, again, looking back in history, if you look at where the EU started out, they started out with EU only projects and they opened up. In the United States, Semitech, we started out with US only and we opened up. Um, if you look at astrophysics in the, at the global level, you had countries starting out, then they opened up. So what we see over and over again is that the system is enriched by greater creativity and flow and new ideas. 
we can show that that's a communication problem. Back to yep. Richard's very first comment about this. It is a communication problem. We need to make it clear to policymakers that the greater uh, churn of this system and the more people are able to find one another, the system outproduces your input. It is much greater the outcomes than, is, than the input. Let the system operate to its maximum effectiveness and we'll have the, the goods that everyone wants. I fully agree. No, okay, uh, Robert Young, one, one quick question. Uh, the EU has had an invitation, as it were, to the US for some time to become associated with Horizon uh, Europe. Um, the Trump administration said no. Do, do you think that'll ever change? Will we ever see, is there any, how would you increase cooperation between the EU and the US? Well, I think, you know, the, the traditional instruments like association, certainly for huge continents like China and the United States, it doesn't work like that. I mean, association is for, you know, the, the, the countries around the European Union who you want to associate, like, but it doesn't work for the major continents. I think we should, we don't have the appropriate mechanisms for the, the global, we have, of course, the CERNs and, 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 and the GEO and the uh, ITER project, but besides that, we don't have such a fund uh, where we really bring the best brains together uh, based on their merits and the excellence that also Caroline was, was saying. That, that, that is lacking and that's why I think that could be a nice initiative from our big leaders to, to launch such a thing and to show we turn the page and we're going to set this up. Okay. I, I think right. we need to take a, somehow we have to give the policymakers a longer term view because these things don't happen instantly. So they have to understand that, that it may take a little time. And if they're uh, you know, worried about elections in, in the next year or the next four years, I mean, somehow it has to be communicated that the, to, to the individuals who are making the decisions um, that the, the payoffs are not going to be within that uh, very short time frame. They're going to pay, they're going to, these things are going to pay off over time. Yeah. Okay. How you convey that? It, it, it's, a, it, it's a very difficult, difficult issue. Okay. Let, let's. Talk, by the way, to the audience, I'll say uh, we'll we will run five minutes over. Okay. Uh, over the original time, uh, if you can join, stay with us for the five minutes. Uh, it would be great. The um, the question. Let's focus just briefly on COVID. Okay. Specifically, uh, what could be done internationally with a new administration to accelerate COVID research? Is it simply what we've been talking about? Let's have a summit, let's, uh, let's create some kind of fund, or do you need more than that? I'd like to address that because I've done a lot of work um, looking at COVID collaboration. Uh, and in fact, as I mentioned at the very earliest days, the US and China made some very important contributions together. And what we also saw in the data, I have a team of folks, so I'm gonna call out to my team, but um, please look for us online. Uh, but uh, the, what we saw is that around April or May, when the government started mucking around in there, um, the, the research um, intensity dropped. Uh, and so we, we saw what was originally very uh, fruitful collaboration drop off. Uh, however, what we saw is that the initial part of COVID research, we saw the most elite institutions and the richer uh, and affected countries come together. But what we also saw is the developing countries very much dropped off almost to nothing in uh, COVID research. Um, that is how the system operates. However, how policy operates is policy comes back in and says, okay, do we need to adjust this system uh, in order to increase fairness of outcome? And there's where I think as we look forward, uh, we have to find a way to bring back in, as I mentioned, our juniors and also our developing countries that are really a very important part of the solution um, in COVID. Yeah. Okay. And it's, uh... The, the COVID-19 crisis, of course, I think Caroline mentioned it, I mean, has brought together scientists from all over the world sharing data and not hiding data behind paywalls, but sharing them openly. I mean, uh, because of the crisis, because of the desperate need for a vaccine. Um, we have other challenges, uh, uh, an, an energy transition, uh, climate fields, there's so many other, uh, why can't we not have similar forms of cooperation, global cooperation uh, in other grand challenges where we really need the best brains of our continents to find solutions. So what we have the situation in crisis we had, 
uh, for COVID-19, working together, sharing data, opening up, do that in other fields as well. But that requires a clear political signal that we are going to do that. That's something that should be on the agenda. Henry, what could be done specifically on COVID? Well, I think there's uh, there's quite a few things that we could do. I mean, first of all, I think uh, uh, tonight, uh, you know, this uh, the webinar is a, is a great uh, way to start. I mean, we have, we're trying to build some consensus and then business science can really, uh, uh, you know, call for all the scientific uh, associations, academic associations, uh, uh, you know, that they can really act to this uh, science, uh, uh, scientific community. Let's work together, uh, you know, before the, 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 the government leaders have a summit, let's have a, a scientific summit and scientific meetings and or at least, uh, uh, you know, have the dialogue with this open uh, election uh, uh, settled down. We can really have a lot of dialogues and so set the right uh, 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 tune and, uh, and uh, atmosphere for, for that. Second, I would like to pose, really propose a, a vaccine summit between the countries because the financial crisis made us G20 summit. Why can't we have a vaccine G20 summit? Because we, you know, eighty percent, ninety percent of vaccine are produced in those countries, and then you know the companies, the multinationals are really uh, uh, trying on those new 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 drugs. So 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 a vaccine. So it's very important that those countries get get something together. And then with the new Biden administration comes in because he really, I mean, I think he wins the election largely because also because of this. Uh, uh, COVID-19. And also President Trump lose these few million uh, voters because of this COVID-19. So I think they were going to really uh, test in the, the Biden administration first time is this uh, COVID uh, fighting. So if he can rally the international community, get G10 leaders to work on that, get all the multinationals to, to come, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, standardize their production or collaborating on that, we can make it much faster rather than where everybody does its own. Thirdly, I think we could uh, have, uh, you know, the uh, vaccine, COVAX, that allies that, uh, initiated by WHO should really be strengthened. US should jump back to support that. Uh, right now, China just, you know, China take a little while, but then China now is part of that. So we should really get that efforts going on for, for quite, quite fast as, as, as fast as we can. Until we really completely, con uh, con 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 you know, contain the virus. I mean, the scientific community travels and the communication, you know, building trust. I think also number four is the building trust and <laughs> rebuild the trust. Uh, you know, with so, the new. Uh, be, let me support there. Henry on the vaccine uh, uh, vaccine summit yesterday in the news. AstraZeneca and Pfizer were balking at the WHO's recommendation of a patent pool, claiming that they've put billions of dollars of their own money into um, this vaccine. In fact. Uh, if you look at what governments have put in, it's billions and billions of dollars yep. into open research that's been widely available um, to these companies to pick up, not to mention the talent that was trained by public money. So I would suggest that we need a patent uh, pool, just as WHO is suggesting, and that we need these governments to pressure these companies um, towards this greater humanitarian good of a patent pool for any COVID vaccine. How would a patent pool work? A patent pool is where um, anyone who is uh, able to can license um, a patent. So in other words, it's, um, it's non-restrictive licensing. Um, so, uh, you know, in fact, the AstraZeneca said, well, um, we're, you know, anything that we're doing, we're going to be sharing it after we earn a profit. Well, in fact, how about before you earn a profit? That you put your patents into a patent pool and allow anyone to license that, uh, and in order to ensure that these um, vaccines are produced around the world, it's like okay. a CCBY license for publications. Right. Okay. Is there another suggestion then, the, the th initiative that we should talk about that, that could restart relations in science? Well, we all are very, we all are very optimistic, uh, Rich, um, that it may happen. So let's hope that Biden will not be so busy uh, inside the United States, become completely absorbed by the domestic agenda, and his life will be made impossible uh, by the Senate, where the Republicans might yeah. come at all. So that will be awful because I mean we are at the moment counting ourselves rich in cooperation and openness, and uh, let's hope that that agenda will really be the agenda, and that he will really succeed because I think uh, he has a lot on, uh, on his hands, Biden, uh, in, in, at national level, eh? uh, in, in, in domestic policy, let's be clear. I, I, have a, 
I, I think the signs are good. There's good indications because he has already said he's going to uh, repeal some of the more draconian measures that the Trump administration put in place with respect to international uh, relations, with respect to, to visas for people to come to the U.S. and with uh, regard to the U.S rejoining uh, international organizations like the Paris Accords. So I think this is a, this is a good start and a good indication that, uh, that the international uh, agenda is going to uh, play a major role. In let's, the, see, let's see how quickly he will appoint a, a chief scientific advisor. It took Trump, I think, three or four years before he appointed Krugermeyer. <laughs> let's see how quickly now <laughs> Biden will appoint an OSDP head, the chief scientific advisor. Uh, that will be quite interesting because that's well, I think, we a see, indicator. Robert, you know, we've seen in the first step that he, one of the first things he announced was a, was a 13-member scientific council on COVID. So, yeah, right. that's, that's true. true. Uh, and no. top talent is already organizing, so have no fear. Okay, about that. good. <laughs> in the next few weeks. All right. Just one last question: Is there any other uh, any other initiative that would help uh, a concrete thing that could be done to increase? I have, uh, I have you know, a final uh, just uh, just a thought for that. Actually, we see that the trade is still one of the key area that can you know keep the go world goes round. And China is part of the major economy is still in the positive territory for this year. So we're seeing actually China and the EU are talking about this comprehensive agreement on investment. So that probably Chinese leadership and, and the EU leadership are probably going to conclude that by the end of this year. We're seeing China going to sign this RCEP for ASEAN countries, Japan, Korea. So that is really give some good news to that region as well. I, I think if Biden comes back, he probably will come back to TPP as well. TPP is that the Obama administration concluded that. And specific partnership, China was, trade deal. Yeah, yeah. China actually showed interest to join TPP now. So after all those trade talks, China has upgraded its standards, uh, all those uh, you know, requirements. So it's good that US and China has those things to talk. So we have an agreement with Europe, we have agreement with Asia, ASEAN, we have agreement with, with, uh, with EU. So I have all those good news so that we need some good start. Vaccine summit will certainly be a good one to change the mood and the dynamic and, and a negative a downward spiral. So at least we can have a floor for that. I published an op-ed on Bloomberg today, which talk about this uh, new Biden stuff. And also a few, a few weeks ago, I published one on the Financial Times on the climate change and how we can better co collaborate. I think those are really great uh, that we are, I can join for these discussions. Okay. There is one, uh, uh, let, let's end with a question from the audience, which, is, uh, which I love. Somebody has, uh, Okay, so if Biden is more positive for science, what happens if Trump wins in 2024? <laughs> well, with all the, with all the legal uh, implications, and if he's not, and the immune, the immune system is not there, uh, protection is not there, I don't know if he can uh, you know, still survive another four years back. I mean, looking from the press, I mean, just. Well, this is where it would help, and I think I challenge science business about this. Let's lay out some metrics of advancement around all of these issues we're talking about. Um, healthcare, uh, uh, climate change, environment. What are some, uh, some ways in which we would say, here are some indicators that things are going in the right direction. Then at the end of four years of this new administration, and we say, here are some of the things we've done. Are we getting closer to our goals? Uh, then we can make a better argument uh, for the fact that openness, sharing, and commitment uh, has better outcomes uh, for uh, the globe, for uh, the environment, for health um, than, um, than not. So perhaps science business can take the lead on that. I, I, absolutely. We, we dive in with anybody who wants to work with us on that. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah, yeah. indeed. And let's uh, also be clear, going back five years it's not the it's not the solution. I mean, we need to move forward because many people say, "Oh, let's go back to the old." No, we should not go back to the old times. We need a new agenda. Well, I no. think that uh, it, I would offer a little caution here. Uh, five years ago or four years ago, who would have predicted that we would be in the state now? Exactly. I, I mean, it's just uh, things are really unpredictable and. Uh, I, uh, I think the chances of Trump actually running again in 2024 are pretty remote, but uh, who knows? I mean, who would have thought he would, he would run in 2016? 
<laughs> you know, people, well, told, people assumed that was a joke. But, uh, he was doing well, this for publicity. Well, well you, know, think you like, you know, you like all political, you like all the political leaders in the United States. So, you know, it's always possible. It's, yeah, it's, it's totally. certainly possible if, uh, if even President Trump doesn't back, the Trumpism is going to stay for sure. That, that's his brief for sure, for 70 million voters. So Trumpism will, will still, you know, have a long way to go, yes. Oh, well, uh, on, the, on that Rich, topic. Rich, let's not end on that note. Let's not end on that note. <laughs> I mean, I did not participate in this uh, session and ending on that note that Trump is, has a long history. I think it's now all up to us, you know, to really make sure that the new wave of openness and cooperation and trust and respect is really uh, Well, successful. actually, that was the second part of that person's question. So if Trump wins again in 2024, should scientists play a role in preventing this for the good of science? Well, he's <laughs> A lot of people have been hurt by globalization. Um, and a lot of times those are the people that voted for Trump. And I think we can see that in a number of countries where people are th thinking about return to national sovereignty. So we have to be aware that even as we create wealth at a certain level and benefits out of it, that that has to be distributed fairly. And that doesn't necessarily occur automatically. So it seems to me we need to be aware of that and looking to public policy to help greater distribution of these goods to ensure that there is greater benefit. Okay. All right. Well, on, on that note, uh, let's conclude this. Um, the, uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for participating. And I'd like to thank uh, you who are watching it for joining in and thank you for your questions. Uh, the, uh, uh, we will be writing uh, an account of this uh, in Science Business, our newsletter today. Uh, so uh, look at that, sciencebusiness.net. Uh, and there, when you go to the site, you can also sign up for our free newsletter twice a week uh, and find out more about our activities, uh, which, as I say, are intended to promote international cooperation in science and technology. So thank you all very much. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank Paul. you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Pleasure. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.